Glenn Beck. The Blaze Radio Network. I'm going to dramatically uh, switch gears here uh, and um, and talk to you about a book that I've been reading. Uh, as you know, if you listen to this program, I'm a big fan of uh, Ray Kurzweil. At the same time, he scares the living daylights out of me um, because I don't hear a lot of talk about ethics. I just talk. I hear a lot of talk about what can be done and what is coming. Um, and uh, I read a lot of Lately, I've been reading a lot of science fiction and a lot of science, and I am um, very much into the future and what is coming and what life is going to be like for us in 10 years. 10 years, that's uh, almost uh, twice as long as it's been since 9-11. It's going to creep up on us fast. And 10 years from now, our lives, our health, our jobs are... Are, are possibly, hopefully, our politics are going to be completely different. And it's very exciting, but it's also terrifying. And it's only terrifying if you haven't thought of these things before. Because they are coming, and you can't put the genie back in the bottle. But do we want it? Should we go this direction? How should we handle it when it does come? Brett King is a, a, a futurist. He is the CEO and uh, uh, founder of uh, Breaking ba- uh, Banks and also a, a podcast host of Breaking Banks. Um, he has written a, um, a great book, Augmented Life in the Smart Lane. And I've been reading it uh, for a while now and really kind of trying to digest it uh, as we go. And it has been a springboard for so many other books that I have been reading because of this book. And I'm honored to have him on, Brett. Brent, welcome, uh, Brett. Welcome to the program. That's great to be on. Thanks for having me. Sure. So, um, I don't even know where to begin with you. Um, it, it, I really kind of want to um, uh, tr- try to just introduce America to some of the thoughts that you uh, put together in uh, Augmented of of what the world is going to be like. Um, coming our way there's uh, you know there is there's jobs there's education there's health and then we get into stuff like ai and robotics but let's just start with with jobs education and health so i I, you know there's four disruptive themes identified in the book obviously the first and and most disruptive technology we're going to deal with over the next 10 20 years is artificial intelligence, but that's going to spur on a whole range of other changes in society. So the first, uh, you know, a notable impact is, you know, we'll be talking to computers, we'll have computers embedded in the world around us that are collecting data and sensors and so forth. And and then that flows on to things like healthcare. For example, uh, you, know, you may have seen in the news a live core just got approval from the FDA to launch a, a, a device, a, a band that essentially attaches to the Apple Watch that uh, can do sort of a full EKG, ECG monitoring of your, your heart rate over time. But when you tie that with an artificial intelligence, they're now expecting within the next 18 months or two years, I'll be able to predict whether you're going to have a heart attack based on that data. So this is where we see the marriage of sort of sensors, uh, sensors and artificial intelligence really changing the way we think about things like healthcare. Yeah, you you talk about um, these sensors in a way that uh, has made me want to wear my um, you know my Apple smartwatch a little bit more. About uh, the way it's going to be able to um, detect um, exactly what's happening in our body. Uh, I mean, we would much rather go to like the ingestibles you're talking about. Like you, you can swallow a computer that can. Read, you know, like you're a diabetes, a diabetes sufferer, you'll be able to you know, swallow a computer in the future that will monitor your, your, uh, your, your blood work and so look at your sugar levels. And then, you know, it won't be long before we have an internal uh, device or be able to dispense insulin, so, you know, regulate insulin in our body without having to inject it and things like that. The, and, and, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a complaint, uh, you know, we can, we can get you to swallow a camera now and ingest that instead of having invasive surgery. I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening on the sensor stuff on the health front. We, uh, are, we, are we entering a time uh, where it's possible to say disease goes away? 
So the, the, the biggest shift in respect to disease won't necessarily be just diagnosis. I think that, you know, what we can do with an imaging AI right now, machine learning, is we can give a, a, an algorithm 3,000, 5,000 medical images with the diagnosis data, and it will be able to do a pretty good job of approximating the diagnosis that you would have got from your, your doctor. So diagnos diagnostic technology is going to increase uh, exponentially, and essentially we're going to get these computers doing the best diagnosis possible. Yeah, talk a know, little bit. Combining all this. Talk a little bit about the um, computer in New York. This is kind of a, an offshoot of Watson. Watson, sure. uh, you know, could beat anybody at chess. Um, they had the idea of, wait a minute, what if we just put all of the medical information into it and all of the different cases and see if it can if it can diagnose cancer? And it's far better than than human doctors. So right now, uh, IBM Watson gets about a 96, 97% hit rate in terms of its diagnosis for specific types of cancer. Now, when you compare that to the best oncologists in um, the US who have 20 years of experience, they get it right about 50% of the time, which of course is why you know, everyone tells you you should always get a second opinion. Um, so that's pretty impressive. Uh, it's, it's obviously fairly new tech, but what would be really good is if we could eliminate cancer altogether. And so what we're working on is technologies like gene editing. And the two major streams of this is CRISPR and Talon, where essentially we can now you know, sequence your DNA, but the future is actually modifying your DNA. So if you've got a disease, a protein switch that results in, say, leukemia, we'll be able to flick that switch to create antibodies instead of creating leukemia just by changing your genome. So I don't know if it was yours, uh, Brett. I, I've been reading so much lately. I, uh, but do you speak about telomeres in your book? Yeah. So yeah. Um, you know, telomere, telomere length is another element for around longevity. Um, and there's a whole lot of new science coming out around longevity now, which is really interesting. But the ability to uh, you know insert telomerase, which is the uh, uh, sort of the the protein that leads to the um, at the end of the DNA is these little um, uh, you know, strands that sort of hold the DNA together, sort of like the aglets you have on your shoelace, and they fray over time. Now, if we can restore them, then it's believed that we can extend life. So, um, you know, this is there's a lot of work going into longevity. Right because now. that is that is as those begin to fray, that's the aging process. So if that's we can. Errors, yeah, errors creep in and that's uh, how we age. Exactly. So. You know, I'm I'm reading your book and and half of it, I am more uh, excited about the future and more convinced that, you know, you just have to just hold on to 2030, 2035 and the world's going to be different. Uh, you're going to I mean, anything that you're dealing with, we're going to be able to take care of. Um, that's kind of the the optimist, uh, optimistic feeling that I get. Um, however, the other half uh, of me, you, you know, you look at, for instance, talk about the climber. Uh, I don't remember his name, the mountain climber that. Uh, oh, yeah, Dr. Hugh Herr. Yeah, yeah. Tell the story. So Dr. Hugh Herr, this is a really interesting one. He uh, when he was 17, he lost both of his legs through frostbite in a, in a climbing uh, incident where he was trapped on Mount Wellington, I think it was, uh, for a few days. And so he was very inspired to, uh, you know, to, to fix that problem. So he went to Harvard and MIT to learn biomedicine uh, and robotics, and he basically built himself new legs. And, and today his friends joke that they're going to have to get amputations as well to keep up with him in terms of his ability to climb a mountain now because of his specialist uh, 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 prosthetics that he's designed to to uh, climb the mountains, you know, but um, this does raise the ethical concern is once we get to the point where prosthetics are able to perform at or at a better level than our own human limbs, what do we do when people start voluntarily um, having amputations to get prosthetics because they're going to get improved performance? What do you think we do? So the, obviously we have to have, you know, we have to start thinking about the ethics of things like artificial intelligence and technology in a pretty structured manner. We can't just let it happen as we have with the iPhone and the internet and so forth. 
where we just let the the pure capitalist uh, approach take. We we need a, a, an ethical structural approach to these technologies. So there is some initiatives coming out like this, like uh, DeepMind, the Google effort. They've created an ethics uh, society to sort of put together or codify ethical standards. But, you know, uh, like uh, it's hard to decide on ethics in our society. Uh, you know, we don't agree on things, as you pointed out at the uh, the start of the show, how do we codify ethics when, as humans, we can't necessarily agree on on a code of ethics amongst ourselves? I I worry about this because I, you know, you also look at people like Vladimir Putin, who has recently come out and said, whoever whoever is the first in with AI controls the world. Uh, I don't think Putin cares about <laughs> you know ethics, uh, or at least well, the same kind of ethics. No, I, I agree with you. Um, so I think there's there's a couple of concerning elements here. Right now, we're, we don't have, obviously, full AI. There's sort of three phases of artificial intelligence. Okay, hang on just a second. I, perspective. Hang on. I, I want to I go there. I have to take a, a, take a break, and we'll come back. Um, I want to talk to um, Brett about uh, education, because we are not ready for the world that is right around the corner. So what do you do to educate yourself? What should your kids be doing right now? Um, and what should they be looking into? Uh, also, the ethics of AI and um, robotics. It is a strange, brave new world that we are headed towards. Give us, if you can, uh, as much as you can, on the three types of AI. So we start out with right now we have machine learning or deep learning where machines can observe and watch human behavior and, and sort of learn to mimic that. Um, so for a self-driving car as an example or a diagnostic uh, algorithm for medical. Then we get to artificial general intelligence where you'll be having a conversation with your AI. So think about Alexa or Siri on steroids where you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that and a, and a human. That's, and then, the, uh, that's probably, the Turing test point? Yeah, that's exactly. Okay. So some, a machine that can pass the Turing test, pull this into thinking it's human. And then we get the strong AI, probably around 2045, something around that time frame, where you have machines that are smarter than humans. Now, you have a chapter that I have uh, read and listened to about four times. Uh, and it is on the robots and um, uh, and artificial intelligence and why it's important to give robots uh, emotions. And in it, you say you give great reasons for robots to have emotions and AI to have emotions. But now for the other more controversial reason why robots need emotions so they don't kill us all. The concept behind some of the most innovative artificial general intelligence minds today, we need to ensure that robots like us and have empathy for mankind. The three laws are not sufficient enough to protect us from the unknowable future of artificial intelligence. Some like Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking believe we need to build very basic motivations as the foundation to future AI, one that enforces a basic love of humans and our planet or planets. The problem, of course, is that any safeguards we are able to implement will always be able to be circumvented by any intelligence greater than our own. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you go on in that. I'll save it for a second. I would like you to talk about this this problem that we have that is possibly coming of artificial intelligence being greater than our own. And as you say... We will be compared to the fly on the plate in the kitchen. If you want to know what's happening, uh, you know, in the future and what you should be thinking about, even all the way down to how we should start educating our kids, what we prepare them for, read Augmented Life in the Smart Lane. Um, Brett, let's let's just start with, um, you know, what I what I left with on we have to start being nice to robots and AI, and we better start really learning that quickly because they're going to be smart enough to uh, best us in anything we do. Well, you know, be kind to of robots is a good uh, good rule, I think. But, you know, when you, when you hear Elon Musk, who, incidentally, you know, despite all his criticism of AI and, and the threat to mankind, he's just announced his own 
AI initiative. So sure. uh, maybe that was a bit of marketing. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, I, it's not necessarily that machines are going to be um, you know malevolent or benevolent. Um, the one thing we're learning is that artificial intelligence they don't think like us as humans. So when we attribute a super intelligence and the fact that it's going to take over the world like a you know T one thousand Terminator, you know we 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 are thinking in human terms, but it's not necessary that machines are going to act like humans. So. I think that's the one saving grace here is that, you know, sufficiently advanced AIs may not really care about us that much. Um, um, they may have their own agenda, um, which we have to cope with. But that's, again, where I think empathy is important. I think if they have empathy for their creator, uh, us, um, I think that that will help us. So I think building empathy and ethics into robotics is sort of key for for a safety valve. Well, I, I mean, you can already see the seeds planted in uh, there's a robotic uh, uh, brothel in Germany now. And people like to go there and, you know, they'll have their way with the robotics and the wives, I guess, wait in the parking lot for the guys because, you know, it's not like really cheating uh, and all this stuff. And you you think about how these robots, some of these robots are going to be used and abused by people. If it is AI, at some point is Kurzweil says in age of spiritual machines, at some point it will say, don't, I'm hurt, I'm lonely. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you do have the human emotion. Well, you know, the other element of this, of course, is as these AIs uh, get very, very good at understanding human behavior and learning to adapt to our concerns. If you have a personal AI encoded in your smartphone, for example, you know, um, it, it, it could become your best friend. In fact, uh, you know, people may fall in love with their AI. Oh, I think they will. In their environment around them. You know, I think that's because if you've got someone who reacts to you in a perfect way, responding to your every need, then, um, you know, that's a great way to build a basis of a friendship. on. I mean, qu quite honestly, Brett, I mean, there's a, they don't they don't have to destroy us. They have to get us to fall in love with them. Uh, and not uh, procreate. I mean, why would I've thought about this for a long time? If I could um, come home and it's the perfect woman who has has every trait that I love physically, mentally, everything else. I don't have to hear about their day. They only care about me. They're thinking what I'm thinking. They're adding something to the conversation. It's mind blowing sex. And if I decide I can change the way she looks or I can change, I can change anything. I want to try something new. Why would you ever go on a date? <laughs> I mean, really? well, you know, this, this may be the resurgence of humanity as well. I think we'll have a, a you know, approach where we get totally into this technology. It infuses in society and people get carried away with it. But, um, you know, there may be an authenticity to the human experience that we miss after a time. And I think, you know, that's probably where as humans we'll need to differentiate. Um, we'll have to differentiate in our very humanity. So, you know, you talked about employment and education. You know, if you want to be relevant in that future, you, you're going to have to be extremely adaptable. But I think the skills that will come to the fore are those that are really human, uh, that that people cater for that real human contact, that human touch, the, that really authentic humanity. I uh, because of your book, I talked to my 13 year old son who is who is just really uh, an empathetic um, kid um, and just loves people and loves children. And I said, you know, have you ever thought about going into nursing and being a nurse practitioner? And we talked about, you know, having your own uh, robotics that you would be watching over several patients, but you would be the one that would be able to come in and kind of telepresence and be able to be there for people and have the actual person to person experience. It's not nursing is not going to be like it is today. Well, you know, if we, you look at the, how AI is going to impact jobs right now, the, you know, the biggest impact we see, you know, particularly in markets like the U S and even China is you know, process where humans are involved in process, ticking the box, following a, following a checklist, uh, you know, the, these sorts of things, accountants, lawyers, uh, you know, uh, bankers, bank tellers. Um, but the thing that where we see a lot of demand coming is those human elements, the creative elements, design and counseling. We think counseling and psychology and those sort of elements, particularly as the role of work in society shifts 
and we become less defined by what we do uh, and more defined by who we are, you know, there's going to be a huge demand for those sort of human elements of uh, you know, behavioral psychology and counseling. So, you know, it's really easy to say, I'll never, I'll never do this. I'll never, I'll never upgrade. I'll never augment. We'll all augment, um, especially you, you describe how uh, super intelligence, uh, artificial super intelligence will, will be so far ahead of us that we won't even be able to understand it. Um, that, uh, you know, and I, I look at if, if I'm an augmented human, I've augmented my brain and I'm connected to the you know, Borg or whatever it would be. Um, I, I am looking at the world differently. I have access to knowledge and I'm talking to a human non augmented. They don't, they can't even follow. And you describe it as a, a fly on a plate in the kitchen. <laughs> well, you know, so, um, you know, Kurzweil and, and Musk of course say that for us to keep up with AI, we're going to have to augment our intelligence. Now this sounds uh, it sounds pretty far-fetched putting neural implants in so we can, you know, do a Google search in our head, for example. But, you know, that's only one step away from where we are today, where we pick up the phone and we, you know, we will ask Google or Alexa to, to search on information. Uh, you know, my kids will never have to pick an Encyclopedia Britannica off the wall to learn about, you know, I don't know how many moons there's around Jupiter. They can just ask their, their computer. So we've already augmented our intelligence, but... Uh, this is, you know, when we talk about things like the robotic prosthesis, um, you know, would you, if you have, uh, you know, um, sh short-sightedness or a problem with your vision, uh, would you be prepared to wear an implant that could give you 20-20 or better vision? Uh, and well, we already wear spectacles, so we, we already have been augmenting our vision for centuries. I will tell you, Brett, that as as I read your book, I've I've... I've always said I won't augment. I won't. I will not put a chip. However, when you really think about it, and if somebody came to me and said, Glenn, I can give you photographic memory. Um, I can give you access to everything. You just implant this in just based on what I do for a living. It would give me such an advantage that yeah. I would really be hard pressed not to do it. Because uh, I would know also if if I don't do it, the other guys are going to do it and there's no way I'll be able to compete. I mean, it's going to be a really tough choice. And this is where science fiction actually informs us about some of these things, because, you know, we've seen sci fi writers write about this and you know, talk about the fact that you've got natural humans versus augmented humans and the battle between these two ethically. And, you know, I think that that's probably a pretty real thing that we're going to have to deal with, of course. Some of it's a little bit more um, simple, uh, you know, like, for example, uh, in, in respect to repairing damage that you might have to your body, um, you know, a prosthesis is there, but we're working on 3D printed organs. So bioprinted kidneys and hearts and things like that. So, you know, you, if you develop a heart disease in the future, we may be able to 3D print you a new heart using your own stem cells. So that it doesn't get, you don't need any rejection medicine anymore. And, you know, you could get a new heart and that could extend your life by 20 or 30 years. Who wouldn't do that? Brad, I have a daughter who has cerebral palsy. She had strokes at birth. And we have talked about this uh, a lot. And, and I know now, uh, you know, exoskeletons uh, are being developed that would give her use of her, full use of her, of her arm and her hand. Um, and is there a time in her lifetime, she's, 29 now where she would have the fog uh, of the way she thinks lifted certainly i think within the next 20 to 30 years that's a that's a real possibility i think we are going to with with both gene therapy and with augmentation technologies i i think the word disability will will disappear from our vernacular are you concerned at all about especially when it comes to gene manipulation, the, the creation of Iceland has, get, has, has now been the only place that has a zero birth rate of uh, Down syndrome. And it's because right. of abortion and early detection. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing. I, I, I mean, you know, I just don't think it's a good, I, I don't know if it's a good thing. I've met a lot of people with Down syndrome and I quite honestly think when I, when I'm with them, I think, and excuse the use of this word, but it's appropriate for us. We're the retarded ones, not them. 
um, they have a connection to humanity. Are you worried at all to to uh, of this world that we're going into that can just make everybody perfect? Designer babies, you know, we've heard talk about it, you know, in, in vitro manipulation of DNA and so forth. Uh, you know, it's obviously there's a huge ethical minefield in terms of where do you stop, where do you start? You know, if there's a, a congenital disease that's going to debilitate, uh, you know, that child for the rest of its life and you can fix it. Then, then why wouldn't you? But at the same time, what if I was able to change your hair color, your skin color, or your muscle tone, uh, you know, and get you to be more athletic or more mathematically inclined? Um, you know, and, and this is where it's a slippery slope. Um, having said that, I think what history teaches us is, uh, and this is the inevitability of this and why I choose to be optimistic, is with all of these technologies and things we think about, um, you know, if, if you look back to the start of the Industrial Revolution, we, we don't have the self-control to limit humanity's experimentation with these yes. things generally. We rush forward and, and embrace this and worry about the complications later. Okay, so I've only got about a minute, and I'd love to have you back um, to talk about banks and, and everything else. That's a, a new book, and of course you're... Yeah, we didn't get to Bitcoin yet. I we? know, we We're didn't, and I'm, I'm out of time, but i, I got to ask you about Bitcoin. Uh, wh- yeah. where, do, where do you see that? Uh, so it is no longer a currency. It's become a crypto asset. It's got a lot of way to grow. I mean, if you look at the U.S. bond market, thirty-one trillion. The gold market, you know, eight trillion. Um, you know, this total cryptocurrency market right now is only about uh, five hundred billion. So I think it's still got a long, long way to go. But don't think of it as a currency. Think of it as an alternative asset class that's sort of replacing commodities like oil, which are no longer got the returns they used to have. Well, and what about things like uh, Litecoin or Ethereum? Is that a currency? Well, so, you know, Ethereum probably has potential to be a currency and there are alternatives to Bitcoin, like, like forks that have occurred, like Bitcoin Cash, that could become uh, on mass currency use. I think we'll start to see different methods of value exchange emerge because we, we live in a digital world where commerce is digital these days and the U.S. dollar has no strategic advantage in that digital landscape. Is there a way that countries are going to say we we we've got to control this and they'll come out with their own cryptocurrency? Yeah, absolutely. China's working on that. Um, they have their own blockchain. They'll, they will launch their own cryptocurrency as a competitor to try and sort of become the, the first digital backed uh, you know, currency. But then Japan and Venezuela and other markets are starting to adopt, uh, you know, Bitcoin as yeah. official currency. So it could go either way, to be honest. All right. Uh, uh, Brett King, futurist, uh, founder of uh, of uh, Moven and author of several books. Bank 4.0 comes out soon. We've been talking to him about augmented life in the smart lane. Thank you so much, Brett. I appreciate it. Glenn Beck. The Blaze Radio Network. Hopper, that's the sound of the week, and my dog just left me before the show even started. Just bailed. Oh, gosh. Well, Stephen, look, I, I actually think millennials are a heck of a lot smarter than the media and the Democrats give them credit. Right. They're better informed, and they understand that there are a lot of politicians who are just lying, who are just shoveling manure. Here's an easy decoding key. Every time the Democrats say a tax cut is a tax cut for the rich, and by the way, that is the only talking point they have. They're going to say it nonstop, tax cut for the rich, tax cut for the rich. That's the only thing they have to say. Understand that by rich, they mean taxpayer. Right. If you are paying federal taxes, you're rich. And, and, and not the debate last week with Bernie, but the one I did a, a, a number of weeks back, Bernie was very explicit. He wants to raise every taxpayer's taxes. You, if you're paying taxes, now it's right. If you're not paying taxes, if you're not working, right. he's happy not to raise your taxes. He'll just give you free stuff to sit at home and not work and just tax everybody else. But if you're actually out working, and you know what? I think millennials are smart enough and, and, and want to, look, want opportunity, want to have a great career, want to have great jobs, 
want to be able to, to change jobs, change professions, pr pursue your dreams, are not particularly interested in letting politicians decide what to do with their money. And you know, one of the things that was interesting, the presidential race, if you went to college campuses, if you talk to young people, college campuses were heavily divided be be between Bernie's campaign and my campaign. We had a ton of support among young people. It was our strongest demographic. Yeah. So did Bernie. And, and when I ran into Bernie supporters out, you know, particularly, you know, college kids, uh, th what I would say to them over and over again, I'd say, you know what? I agree with Bernie. Bernie says Washington is corrupt. Both parties are in on it. Both parties are in bed with big business and the rich and the powerful, the lobbyists. All of that's true. Washington is fundamentally corrupt, fundamentally broken. And, and you'd see these, you know, people look at me and kind of, what, what do you mean you agree with Bernie? I don't understand. And, and I'd say, look, the only place Bernie and I disagree is the solution. Yeah. If Washington is corrupt, why on earth would you want to give a whole lot more money and more power to Washington? If you don't like what they're doing with it now, keep the money, keep the power with you, the people, and keep it out of Washington, D.C. Well, I think you disagree on the solution as it relates to Washington and also the concept of hoarding. I expect to find Senator Sanders in an episode of that. It's like, there's so many cats! <laughs> okay, uh, on that note, I know we want to talk about the uh, Amendment 529, but on that note, net neutrality. This is something... I, I, I will say, by the way, the image of Bernie as the cat lady from The Simpsons is a little terrifying. It is, it is, because it's a little... <laughs> it hits a little too close to home. When he was coming down that aisle in the plane, I could see him, you know, whipping him down. <laughs> the <laughs> yes, whipping him down at uh, us lesser economy non plus plus. Um, net neutrality, huge issue on YouTube yeah, right yeah. right now. All of these creators, I'm one of the few going, hold on a second. If we actually look at what net neutrality is, um, a lot of it, it's an issue that's obfuscated. One thing yes. uh, that I find interesting and nobody else is discussing, people always like to vilify corporations like we just talked about, the wealthy, okay, Verizon, Comcast, and of course all the mom and pop ISPs. But the support from Google and YouTube and Facebook yeah. for net yes. neutrality, are we supposed yes. to believe they're all of a sudden virtuous? I, I have my suspicions, but I would love to hear from someone like you, why do these giant, well-known leftist corporations with a history of censorship and curation so adamantly support net neutrality? Oh, look, it's the same game. It's actually the same answer what we were just talking about a minute ago. Washington is corrupt. Right. And so the big corporations, the power players, want as much power in Washington as possible because who do you think the government regulators listen to? They listen to the big lobbyists. I, I love the Internet. Why do I love the Internet? Because it grew up unregulated. It, it grew up, nobody had to come to Washington on bended knee and ask someone's permission. You, you know, when you, when you started your show, did you get anyone's permission? Did you have to file a permit? No, you just started recording and putting it out there. It's true. That's the internet has been this incredible oasis of free speech. You can say whatever you want. You can, if you're right or if you're full of it, you can say either one and let what John Stuart Mill called the marketplace of ideas decide. Right. Entrepreneurship. You want to start a small business? You can make a product in your living room, put up a website and sell all over the world instantaneously. You don't need distribution. You don't need advertising. You have a portal to the world. Now, what was net neutrality? Net neutrality was the Obama FCC for the first time ever seizing the power to regulate the Internet. And what they did is they declared the Internet to be what's called a Title II regulated monopoly. What's a Title II regulated monopoly? The phone company. Right. And this was, this was 2015, right, for people who don't understand the timeline. Because net neutrality, is a, as a, an umbrella term, has existed for a long time. But I think it's, we're talking about 2015. The specific changes, a lot of people aren't aware of that very yes, acute yes, switch. Yes. So prior to 2015, federal government regulators didn't have the power to regulate the Internet. And it grew up free and unregulated and untaxed, and there's nothing a socialist hates more than something that is free of government regulation and government taxes. They want their sticky little fingers all <laughs> over everything you're doing on the Internet. Yes. And so the Obama FCC just declared, we're treating it like a telephone monopoly from the 1930s. And the Obama FCC claimed the power to regulate prices and terms of service. So every term of service, which means they claim the power to decide, you know what, we don't like what you're doing on the Internet, so we're not going to allow you to do it. And, you know, how are we going to decide if we like it or not? Well, we'll let a bunch of big corporate lobbyists lobby us one way or another. And you know what? Magically, the giant corporations will be favored. When you think of innovation, 
Do you think of the old government monopolies? I'm trying to think. Uh, it do, it's not the first thing that springs to mind because now I still have my mind on Bernie Sanders as the cat man. So, um, but come back to me and maybe, but uh, I think the answer is no. This, at the end of the day, is about government power. And, and, and they've, that they've concocted this boogeyman that, that, that internet service providers might suddenly start regulating what content you're allowed to see. Well, you know what? No ISPs are doing that, and more fundamentally, would you sign up for an internet company that says you can get this website but not that one? Heck no. You, you want to be able to access whatever you want on the web. That's what consumers want. Right. And so this whole power grab. Except actually not necessarily. Here's, here's something that's interesting to me. You know, if you talk about these rural areas, the idea is there's no competition. Let's say in rural Mississippi, I think yeah. Cable One, right? Well, hold on a second. They only have one broadband provider. I understand that. But at the same time, they have eight mobile carrier providers. And you, yeah. T-Mobile can, it's different with applications, say, hey, Spotify doesn't count toward your data cap. Or AT&T can say, Netflix doesn't count toward your data cap. If you, I'm going, you know what? If I'm doing nothing but downloading 4K videos all day, I, I I don't mind paying for a different plan than my grandmother who does nothing but forward prairie dog pictures. I'm okay with it. Look, but, but Stephen, the, the, the beauty of it is that never happened. No. So this was literally an imaginary danger. They concocted, to go back to The Simpsons, they concocted Mr. Burns. Yes. Mr. Burns, excellent, just regulating everything. And they said, here's the solution to Mr. Burns. We're going to have government take it over and have the power to regulate the whole internet. My position is simple. No regulations, no taxes, leave the internet the hell alone. I don't want Washington regulators touching the internet. And, and that's what the FCC is doing. It's going back to saying, now, fraud, deception, if people are ripping people off, there's of a long time, you can, you can sue someone, there's law enforcement. You know, if you're breaking the criminal laws, doesn't matter if you're doing it on the internet or, or, or in the bricks and mortar world. But we don't need government regulators deciding what websites can open up. We don't need government regulators deciding what content you can have. And by the way, you look at Europe, you look at China, they regulate content aggressively on the internet. And the big tech companies, Apple, Apple just complied with China pulling down the apps that let people get uncensored content. Right. And, you know, the big tech companies are perfectly happy to get in bed with these totalitarian thugs. My view here, if you like freedom on the internet, the worst thing for internet freedom is giving Washington bureaucrats the power to regulate your internet. Well, okay, I know you're busy, but if I may float a theory, because this might take yeah. just a couple minutes here. I talked about this earlier this week with net neutrality. Like you said, you talk about regulating them under, under Title II, like a telecommunications <laughs> company. Okay, if we continued with net neutrality, right, they would be allowed to set prices. They'd basically be allowed to tell ISPs how you have to treat all content outside yep. of antitrust laws. Now, in this case, an emphasis in the laws we're talking about is on transparency. I've talked about this a lot. The government can micromanage or they can provide strict oversight. You can't play for a team and be a referee. So in this instance, we're erring on the side of being a referee. Here's something that I find interesting. A lot of people, including some people on Fox News, I think Tucker Carlson talked about regulating YouTube, Google, Facebook as uh, under Title II because they thought it was a monopoly, that people were requiring these to communicate. Now I said, hold on a second, no. Of course I'm against it. I don't want to tell YouTube what they have right. to allow on their site. But I do think if you were to say, okay, we're going to apply the same kind of regulation as we do to ISPs, demanding transparency, YouTube, meaning you have to let people know if you're throttling conservative content, meaning Facebook, you have to let people know if you're banning news you don't like. A lot of people would be on board. Does it stand to reason that maybe that's why they're a little bit cautious about the transparency laws that we're talking about here? Yeah, I, I don't even think they're that cautious. You know, we, we had a Judiciary <laughs> okay. Committee hearing. Uh, where, where Democrats were, were hyperventilating, were, were bellowing that, that we've got to regulate all the tech companies because there were Russian ads. And it was all about, we've got to prevent Russian ads. You know what? The last thing I want is government regulators deciding what ads can run on Google or Facebook or anyone else. Right. Now, the problem you mentioned, I'm very worried about. I think these big, big tech companies have a terrible record of censorship, a terrible record of trying to push their own political agendas. Now, I don't think government should regulate them, but I do think right now under current law, the big tech companies enjoy immunity from liability under what's called the Communications Decency Act, and right. it's based on the premise that they're public forums, that they're just letting people speak. Well, you know what? If they're not just letting people speak, if they're actively engaging and pushing their own political agenda, 
that's fine. They have a First Amendment right to do it, but there's no reason they should be given immunity from liability if they defame someone, if they commit conduct that can prompt a lawsuit. Congress shouldn't be bathing them in the gift of liability if they're not, in fact, a public forum. Well, especially because so many people make their living off of YouTube. You know, for us, we yeah. saw our advertising cut down to a quarter, and they said, oh, it's an algorithm. And we said, well, hold on, can we, can we look at this algorithm? Because you ran ads yeah. for us to put our videos on YouTube. You invited us here. Ah, uh, no, we can't show you. Okay, listen, well, yeah. we could talk about that all day. You specifically have been uh, spearheading this amendment, uh, I think 529 amendment, when we're talk we yes. going back yes. to, to taxes now. Tell people what that's about and uh, where they can go to, to to follow it. Well, late Friday night when we were voting on tax reform, there was one amendment adding a provision to the bill that passed. The only amendment that passed was an amendment I introduced, and, and it concerns 529 college savings accounts, which, which many of the folks listening may have had 529s, may be saving. It's a tax advantage vehicle that you can save for the college education of your kids or your grandkids, and, and it works like a Roth IRA. So you put money in after tax. And then all the growth of the money is tax-free. And so it's a really powerful tool to save for college. The amendment I introduced that, that passed was an amendment that says 529s that are incredibly powerful, you can spend them not just on college, you can also spend them on K through 12 education. You can spend them on public school, on private school, on religious school, on homeschooling. It puts parents and grandparents and kids in a position of controlling your own savings. It goes back to the theme we've been emphasizing over and over again, putting you in charge of your money instead of politicians in Washington. It came to a vote after midnight on Friday night on the Senate floor. The Senate ended up dividing 50-50. Actually, let me tell you the inside drama because you'll, you'll enjoy this. I do, I want some House of Cards kind of business here. Give it to me. All right, so we're, <laughs> we're standing on the Senate floor. We have 52 Republicans, so very narrow majority. First one, then two Republicans vote no. So the Senate floor staff calls the vice president, calls Mike Pence and says, Mr. Vice President, we need you down here. He was at his home at the residence of the Naval Observatory. We need you down here to break the tie. So the vice president gets in the motorcade, starts heading down Massachusetts Avenue. Then Joe Manchin, a Democrat from West Virginia, comes down and votes yes, votes with me. And there's an audible gasp in the well of the Senate. And so the floor staff, they pick up the phone and they call Pence and say, Mr. Vice President, we don't need you after all. We've got the votes. Manchin just voted yes, so turn around and go home. So the motorcade turns around, starts heading back. Manchin returns to his desk, and Senate Democrats descend on him like locusts. I mean, they're surrounding <laughs> him and yelling him. I'm, I'm pretty sure they just started sticking knives in him. Right, yeah. Uh, like in a bullfight, you know, the, the people that stick all the spears. Someone at C-SPAN <laughs> is going, camera four, camera four, switch, 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 yeah. <laughs> And after five minutes, Joe cried uncle, and he walked down and he switched his vote to a no. Right. And so the floor staff had to pick up the phone, call the vice president a third time, and say, I'm sorry, Mr. Vice President, we do need your vote. He turned the motorcade around yet again. We waited 15 minutes for him to drive from the Naval Observatory to the Capitol, and he came to the floor and he said, the eyes being 50, the nays being 50, the president of the Senate votes in the affirmative, and that amendment was passed. And the beauty of it is there are 50 million school kids in America at any given time. That is a tax cut for every school child, for every parent, for every grandparent. That lets you, I've got 529s for both my daughters. Next year, I'm gonna start using those 529s, not just to save for college, but also to help pay for their education now in first and fourth grade. That is real. It is the most significant national school choice legislation we have seen perhaps ever right and, and it is powerful tax relief to tens of millions of parents and grandparents Hold on, you, and kids do you hear that that's the sound of teachers unions going yeah! <laughs> uh, so uh, that is that is fantastic. I hope people again. This is something I hope people who are watching who may disagree with Senator Cruz, people who are left or right, can go. Oh, okay. Hold on a second. Here's a solution that costs us as opposed to trillions or billions. Um, nothing. We're putting hands back and the uh, money back in the hands of Americans that we can find some crown, common ground. If we want to talk about finding common ground, I don't know how allowing people to save for themselves, giving them tax incentives to be responsible, and giving them more choice. How anyone could be against it? I know you are busy, Senator. Thank Thank you very much for taking that. You look, you look rested. I would imagine there's a weight lifted off your shoulders after this last I, week. I, th th there is. Um, I, I am encouraged. We're actually doing our jobs, and we're getting something powerful done. And and uh, 
and, and I'm encouraged. We need to finish it. We need to go across the finish line and get the job done, but I think we're going to get that done. A major tax cut for every American by the end of the year, and then we need to go back to Obamacare repeal and regulation reform and unleash small businesses so that we have more and more jobs, higher wages, and we ought to trust the people and take power out of Washington. Absolutely. Thank you so much. At Ted Cruz, next time I want you to have told uh, Senator Sanders to stop throwing cats. We'll be back after this. <laughs> I'm now home alone, but realistic. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what I ask of you is not easy. I ask that you ignore the media circus and prior knowledge regarding the criminal trial. As today, in this counter-civil suit, I intend to prove to you that the actions on behalf of one Kevin McAllister were excessive, egregious, and cruel use of force, which were both entirely unnecessary and have no place among civilized society. Ladies and gentlemen, my clients are guilty of petty theft. That's true. Trying to feed their families, scraping by. And for that, I make no excuses. But Mr. McAllister escalated these events, hitting my clients with paint cans, lead pipes, tool bags, tool chests, bricks, shooting them with BB guns, electrocuting them with 12,000 volts of electricity, blow torching them, causing third degree burns twice and, as previously disclosed by one of my clients, Marv Merchant, not being here today, drove a rusty nail through my client's foot, resulting in his subsequent passing from tetanus. And for that behavior, we all should offer no excuse. Your Honor, I'd like to call my first witness to the stand, Mr. Harry Lime. Stay tuned for more Home Alone, but realistic. And now listen to this. Sure. 